uh, with our aging population. Uh, in the red is all valvular heart disease, and the dark blue is the mitral valve disease. Over the age of 75, almost 10% uh, of individuals, meaning one in 10, will have uh, more than moderate valvular heart disease. And this population is growing um, as we speak. Uh, this also is a slide that uh, you have seen uh, quite frequently, which is the large unmet need for treatment of mitral regurgitation. Based on the 2016 statistics, there are over 4.6 million patients with more than moderate mitral regurgitation, of which about 2 million have a 3 plus or more, which is moderately severe or severe. Um, the number of surgeries annually performed in the United States based on the SDS database is about 55,000. So only about 3% of the potential patient population uh, that could be or should be treated uh, are undergoing surgery. So there is a large and growing unmet clinical need for something other than surgery, i.e. transcatheter mitral valve therapy in this growing patient population. Uh, this is a slide, uh, this is a, some work which I did when I was a fellow at Cleveland Clinic. We looked at over a thousand patients with severe mitral regurgitation and uh, uh, heart failure diagnosis. And you can see clearly uh, on the upper pie chart, uh, three quarters of these patients had functional mitral regurgitation and about a quarter had degenerative mitral regurgitation, probably representative of everybody's practice. And when we looked at patients who had surgery versus no surgery, uh, vast majority of degenerative MR patients had surgery. Uh, only a small proportion were treated medically. In contrast, vast majority, almost 50% of functional MR patients were managed only medically. These are patients with significant MR, three plus or four plus, who are medically managed um, and are uh, still symptomatic. Uh, whereas only a quarter of FMR patients had surgery, and most of these were in the setting of concomitant coronary bypass surgery or other valvular surgery. We also looked at the outcomes of these patients over five years. Uh, in the dark blue is the mortality, and the light blue is the heart failure hospitalization. When you see from one year to five year, the mortality increases from 20% at one year to 50% at five years. And concurrently, the proportion of surviving patients hospitalized with heart failure goes up from 40% at one year to almost 90% at uh, five years. So as you all know, mitral regurgitation is, is a very uh, morbid disease associated with high mortality and costs of healthcare. Uh, quick slide on mitral valve anatomy. Uh, mitral valve is a very complex uh, a valve. Uh, the mitral apparatus, as we like to call it, consists of the anterior and the posterior leaflets of the mitral valve, uh, the supporting chordate tendine, the corresponding papillary muscles, which is the posterior medial and the anterolateral papillary muscle, and uh, which is in turn supported by the ventricular myocardium. Uh, a pathology affecting any of these components uh, will lead to significant mitral regurgitation, uh, as we'll talk about uh, during the course of this uh, talk. The mitral valve, uh, this is a surgeon's view looking at the mitral valve from the left atrium. The anterior mitral leaflet and the posterior leaflet, these are divided into three scallops from lateral to medial, A1, A2, and A3, and posteriorly P1, P2, and P3. Here is the anterior commissure or the lateral commissure, and medially is the posterior commissure or the medial commissure, and this is the aortic, aortic mitral curtain. This uh, uh, nomenclature is very important to understand to be on the same page as the surgeon and the echocardiographer when we're doing these uh, transcatheter valve procedures, uh, a large part of which is TE guided. Uh, <clears throat> to keep it simple, uh, I like to think of the causes of mitral regurgitation as primary, which uh, is intrinsic involvement of the leaflets and the chordae, and secondary, uh, wherein the leaflets themselves are okay, but the, the pathology is caused by the left ventricle or the myocardium. And, uh, this is the Carpentier classification, which is very important to know. Uh, the type 1 and the type 3B are the uh, functional mitral regurgitation patients where there is dilated annulus uh, in the setting of ischemic or non-ischemic uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or a restricted posterior leaflet, as you can see in the setting of a patient with posterior or inferior posterior myocardial infarction with a te tethered posterior leaflet. In these cases, the leaflets themselves are not pathologic, but the uh, etiology of mitral regurgitation is related to the, to the underlying left ventricular myocardium. Uh, on the other hand, type 2 is where there is excessive tissue or redundant tissue leading to prolapse or flail. This is your classic degenerative mitral regurgitation. Uh, and we'll talk about how mitral clip can be useful in uh, all these subgroups of patients. Type 3 are really the ones that are, type 3A are the ones that are not suitable for mitral clip because they have uh, thickening, retraction of the leaflet, such as rheumatic uh, heart disease, such as the slide I showed you uh, a few minutes ago, and also those with carcinoid. These are not suitable for uh, mitral clip, um, but may be suitable for other procedures. Here is an example of uh, a patient with degenerative 
uh, mitral regurgitation or Carpentier class 2. As you can see, there is excessive uh, le leaflet motion, thickness, tissue prolapse, and frankly, flail of the uh, P2 scallop of the uh, posterior leaflet, resulting in very severe eccentric, eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. So this is uh, a classic degenerative MR or uh, type 2 Carpentier uh, mitral regurgitation. On the other hand, this slide shows the uh, typical appearance of functional mitral regurgitation. This is a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy with annular dilatation, LV dilatation, significant LV dysfunction, um, apical displacement of the papillary muscles, and tethering of the leaflets to the degree that you see non-cooptation on the bottom left there uh, with resultant severe mitral regurgitation. You can also appreciate the degree of non-cooptation in the short axis on the, uh, on the top left there. So this is Carpentier class um, uh, 3B. Uh, just a quick slide on uh, quantification of MR. When we talk about structural uh, interventions, uh, the quantification is very important. Um, on the left is the European guidelines and the, on, the, on the right is the American uh, Society of Echo guidelines. Uh, so you have qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative uh, methods of quantifying mitral regurgitation. Of course, if you have severe leaflet prolapse and flail, as I showed you in the previous slide, uh, uh, you know, that is uh, pretty easy to figure out uh, the degree of mitral regurgitation. But we use a lot of, uh, you know, usually a combination of things, uh, such as the, uh, the jet, the, uh, the, the, the CW Doppler, the vena contracta, the pulmonary uh, uh, Doppler, uh, you know, the systolic flow reversal is a very good marker. Uh, but most importantly, the quantitative measure measures are very objective, and these are what are used in trials, such as the, effect, uh, the effective regurgitant orifice area, uh, regurgitant volume, and regurgitant fraction. So these are very important to, uh, to measure when you're evaluating these patients for transcatheter therapies. In addition to the quantification of MR, the LV dimensions and function is important, and these can be uh, adequately studied with the help of uh, 3D uh, uh, echocardiography with uh, volumetric analysis in two-chamber, three-chamber, and four-chamber uh, views, uh, in addition to cardiac MRI, which is playing an inc ever-increasing role in the evaluation of mitral regurgitation uh, because of uh, excellent resolution. Uh, the next slide shows uh, uh, some images of, uh, it's, this is supposed to play, but this is a, a case of posterior uh, flail with severe eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. And MRI is playing a very important role as we go along in evaluating patients uh, to look at the pathology, the LV dimensions, LV size, uh, in addition to uh, uh, viability in patients with ischemic mitral regurgitation. Um, so moving on now uh, to the edge-to-edge -edge technique uh, or the mitra clip. Uh, the edge-to-edge -edge technique was, uh, uh, the, the foundation behind this is the surgical edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair which was pioneered by Dr. Um, uh, Alfieri uh, who's an Italian surgeon, uh, almost two decades ago now. And uh, the Mitra Clip is a transcatheter edge-to-edge uh, -edge, uh, repair system, which is performed via transvenous femoral axis and transeptal axis. Um, here is the delivery uh, guide, uh, which is a 24 uh, French guide catheter, and the clip delivery system with the Mitra Clip at the end. Uh, many of you have already seen this. This, this is inserted through the uh, femoral vein. Uh, we go transeptally, and then uh, by way of these buttons and knobs on the delivery system and the guide, we're able to steer the catheter down to the level of the mitral valve and uh, um, uh, grasp the leaflets. In this example, the anterior and the posterior leaflet in the central position, uh, and uh, this is done with, uh, mainly with TE guidance, and then on the bottom right, you see the clip released here. So we'll show you some examples of this. So this slide just shows the evolution of Mitra Clip. Uh, the evolution has been quite remarkable. Uh, Mitra Clip, uh, you know, developed in parallel with the with the with the transcatheter aortic valve replacement, but the trajectory has been somewhat different. Partly because the mitral uh, valve is much more complex, and these patients are are different compared to our aortic stenosis patients. So the first case of Mitra Clip was performed in 2003. Um, this was uh, the Mitra Clip received a CE mark back in 2008. Everest trial was published in 2011, uh, followed by the Everest High Risk Registry in 2013, and concomitantly the FDA approved this for degenerative MR. Um, the COAP trial, which was a very rigorous trial, which we'll talk about, was finally published in 2018, and then FDA approved the Mitra Clip for treatment of secondary or functional mitral regurgitation just last year. So this has been quite a remarkable uh, journey, uh, and I was fortunate to be part of this during my training and now in my practice. <coughs> Here is the New England Journal publication of the Everest II randomized trial uh, comparing Mitra Clip with surgery for degenerative, predominantly degenerative mitral regurgitation. Um, this was published back in 2011. 
And uh, we'll talk about the five-year results because they are relevant. Uh, percutaneous repair was less effective in reducing mitral regurgitation than conventional surgery. However, the procedure was associated with superior safety and similar clinical improvements and outcomes. Um, so here is the uh, flow chart of the Everest II randomized study. Im important to keep in mind, this was compared against surgery, uh, whereas the approval is for prohibitive surgical risk patients. We'll talk about that as we go along. But 279 patients were randomized. Um, 95 patients were assigned to the surgery group and 184 patients assigned to the percutaneous repair or the mitroclip group. Um, here is the baseline characteristics. This is from the uh, JAC publication in 2015 um, where uh, the five-year outcomes were uh, looked at. So uh, I'd like to draw your attention. These patients were relatively younger compared to the patients that we do in today's day and age. Uh, mean age was 67. Um, they had significant number of comorbidities. Uh, most of these patients had normal ejection fraction. The mean ejection fraction was around 60%. Uh, they were all symptomatic. Um, vast majority of them had 3 plus MR, about a quarter had 4 plus MR. And as you can see in the bottom here, um, about three quarters of these patients had degenerative mitral regurgitation and about a quarter had uh, functional mitral regurgitation. And also important to note, almost a third had uh, anterior or bileaflet prolapse or flail. Uh, when you look at the five-year outcome, the Kaplan-Meier freedom for mortality, the curves are almost superimposed. There's no difference in the mortality of these patients uh, out to five years, um, comparing surgery versus mitroclip. Of course, when you compare the freedom from uh, reoperation or redo mitroclip, there is a difference in favor of surgery, meaning fewer patients uh, in the surgical arm required a reoperation, uh, whereas uh, more patients in the mitroclip arm required uh, a redo or, or surgery. About 80% of these patients had to have a redo procedure within the first six months. But after the first six months, uh, the curves are again superimposed, meaning upfront there was an early hazard of a group of patients after the mitral clip that required a surgery because of persistent uh, significant mitral regurgitation. But once that early hazard was overcome, the curves are superimposed out to five years. Uh, MR reduction and NYHA functional class. There were significant reductions in the MR grade uh, compared to baseline out to 12 months, out to five years, and these reductions were durable in both surgical arms and the mitroclip arms. Uh, similarly, the NYHA class uh, improvement, uh, as you can see, most of these patients in 12 months and five years were NYHA class one or two compared to three or four uh, at baseline, and these were sustained out to five years in both the surgical as well as mitroclip. Uh, what about durability uh, and LV remodeling? This slide just shows that the LV volume reduction at five years uh, was persistent after five years, meaning the results were still durable out to five years in addition to reduction in the mitral regurgitation. So based upon the Everest trial and the uh, registry, the FDA approved MitraClip for treatment of percutaneous reduction of significant symptomatic mitral regurgitation, which was defined as three plus or more due to primary abnormality of the mitral apparatus or degenerative MR, meaning Carpentier class two, in patients who have been determined to be at prohibitive risk for mitral valve surgery by a heart team, which includes a cardiac surgeon experienced in valve surgery, a cardiologist experienced in valve disease, and in whom the existing comorbidities would not preclude the benefit from reduction in mitral regurgitation. Um, this eventually made its way into the guidelines, and MitraClip um, is now listed as a class 2B indication for patients with symptomatic NYHA 3 or 4, severe primary MR with favorable anatomy, prohibitive surgical risk, and who remain symptomatic despite guideline-directed medical therapy. So this is the degenerative MR. What about the outcomes in the real world? So Paul Saraja published this, this in Jack uh, almost three years ago now. Uh, 100, almost 150 hospitals, uh, close to 3,000 mitra clips. Uh, as you can see, a uh, vast majority had 3 plus or 4 plus MR on the base, at baseline. And post-implant, 93% had two plus or less mitral regurgitation with 60% patients with zero or one plus mitral regurgitation. So uh, good results. Uh, uh, the procedure is uh, uh, safe. The in-hospital mortality was 2.7, 92% uh, success rate. SLDA or single leaflet device attachment was only 1.5%. This is real world data. This is not randomized trial. Length of stay, two days. Most of these patients go home. 85% of these patients were discharged home. Uh, this slide just uh, lists the anatomic criteria that define suitability for mitroclips. So this is very important when we look at these patients, when we look at their transthoracic and transesophageal echo. Uh, so based upon the experience that has uh, been uh, gathered over the last 10 years, 
Um, there are optimal criteria and there are conditional criteria and then there are unsuitable criteria. So optimally the pathology would be central A2P2, no leaflet calcium, large mitral annulus, good mobile uh, leaflets, uh, whereas there are conditional in which case you know mitral clips are considered on a case by case basis. Uh, but we have done a lot of these cases where there are non-central pathology and I'll share some examples. There may be some mild calcification uh, outside the uh, grasping zone. Uh, the, the length may not be uh, more than 10, but 7 to 10. Uh, there may be some restriction in systole, particularly in our ischemic cardiomyopathy patients. So these are patients which are not optimal but can be performed. And frankly, uh, a lot of these patients are being performed um, in the real world because um, not all patients are um, optimal um, trial candidates. So here is a good example of uh, P2 flail. Again, this is supposed to play. Um, it is not playing. Um, this is supposed to be a case of a classic P2 flail uh, with severe eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation, which was successfully treated with two clips. Uh, so relatively straightforward uh, case. Again, I'm sorry, uh, these uh, uh, videos were supposed to play. This was a case of uh, A1 flail, which is on the lateral commissure. You can see, uh, based on the still image here on the left uh, panel, there is a flail segment in the lateral commissure. This is a lateral commissure. This is where the appendage is supposed to be. And this patient has severe eccentric mitral regurgitation as a result. Um, I apologize, these videos are not playing. But this, this, these examples were to show that uh, non-central pathology can be successfully treated with the mitra clip as, can be, uh, as, the, as the central pathology can be as well. And in that example, the post uh, gradient was only one millimeter of mercury. So these patients can be and are being successfully treated with the mitra clip. What is also most important to uh, uh, realize and, and, and measure is the, is the uh, hemodynamics. So we do this in all cases. We measure the left atrial pressure directly with the guide catheter, um, pre-clip and post-clip. So in that case, the pre-left uh, atrial pressure, the V-wave was almost 80 millimeters of mercury as you can see on the left panel here. And post-mitra clip, the V-wave, there was a significant reduction uh, down to about 25 millimeters of mercury. So this is very, you know, this is a very good result. This is what we want to see. And you know, you, when you see this, you know that this patient is going to feel symptomatically better. And indeed, that was the case when we saw him in follow-up. Um, so those were some examples of central and non-central mitral regurgitation. Uh, what about redo clipping? Remember, I mentioned in the Everest criteria, some patients had to come back for a redo procedure. And we've had that clinically. This was a patient that I treated almost three and a half years ago with a P2 flail. Uh, which was very severe, uh, associated with very severe mitral regurgitation and symptoms. Patient was successfully treated with one mitral clip and almost near abolishment of the mitral regurgitation. Patient was symptomatically significantly improved. Uh, he was able to walk two miles. And then about uh, two years later, I saw him back in clinic and follow up and he reported similar symptoms. And I was able to appreciate a murmur and uh, we saw this. So the clip is still attached, but there is significant mitral regurgitation medial to the clip. So this is likely due to progressive degeneration of the valve, and we were able to put a second clip medial to the original clip uh, with the final result in the bottom right here uh, with trace regurgitation and again associated symptomatic uh, improvement. So uh, in some cases we can go back, we evaluate this on a case by case basis, and again imaging plays a key role, the baseline gradients, the, the valve area and so on um, in order to treat these patients successfully. Um, this is another interesting case, uh, page, uh, papillary muscle rupture. Uh, this was not a post-infarct papillary muscle rupture, but a case of Taver, uh, a very elderly uh, lady in her uh, mid-80s underwent transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And during the procedure, she underwent uh, successful Taver, but the, uh, the curly wire, the confida, or the uh, safari wire uh, led to avuls, uh, avulsing of the uh, papillary uh, muscle. As you can see, the papillary muscle is flailing back and forth um, associated with a very severe eccentric uh, mitral regurgitation with a huge quanda effect. And on the top right, you can see there is a missing papillary head here. Uh, the anterolateral papillary muscle is missing. The posteromedial is right here. And again, you can see the papillary muscle on this bottom left flailing in and out of the LVOT. So this patient was successfully treated. She was not a surgical candidate. Heart team discussions were held. And she was treated successfully with two mitral clips. Uh, in the A2P2 scallop region with uh, mild residual mitral regurgitation, as you can see in the bottom uh, middle uh, uh, clip here. And here's the 3D image. So this patient continued to do very well uh, out uh, about a year and a half from her procedure. So there are different kinds of pathologies. I know Paul Soraja has a series of uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that he has successfully treated with the mitral clip. So these were the degenerative mitral regurgitations or the Carpentier class 2 
um, um, patients. What about functional MR? This forms the, the vast majority of mitral regurgitation that we see uh, and manage on a daily basis. So you all know the COAP trial, which is the randomized open label multicenter trial consisting of 610 patients with heart failure and moderate to severe or severe MR who remained symptomatic despite maximally tolerated guideline-directed medical therapy. They were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to MitraClip plus guideline-directed medical therapy or GDMT versus GDMT alone, about 305 patients in each arm. This was a very rigorously done trial. It took a long time to complete uh, and uh, I'd like to share some of these results with you. The primary effectiveness endpoint was all heart failure hospitalization through 24 months. The primary safety endpoints was freedom from single leaflet device attachment, device embolization, endocarditis requiring surgery, mitral stenosis, LVAD, transplant, or any device-related complication requiring non-elective surgery. So the MitraClip procedure was performed in 302 patients and the success rate was uh, in the high 90s. The mean number of mitra clips was 1.7. Vast majority of patients had either one or two mitra clips. A few had more than two. Uh, here are the procedure time and the, de and the device time. Uh, this is a very effective treatment. The transthoracic echoid discharge, the MR grade was one plus or less in 82% patients. Almost 95% patients had MR grade two plus or less after the mitra clip procedure. So very effective treatment. What about the primary effectiveness endpoint? So the blue curve is the GDMT alone. This is all hospitalizations for heart failure in 24 months compared to MitraClip plus GDMT. So a very striking difference in favor of the MitraClip plus GDMT as compared to GDMT alone. A hazard ratio of 0.53 and a highly statistically significant p-value. Looking at it differently, the number needed to treat was three to prevent one heart failure hospitalization uh, over a period of 24 months. So these were remarkable findings which were in favor of MitraClip plus GDMT as opposed to GDMT alone. I must remind you that GDMT was very uh, meticulously uh, managed in this uh, trial. Uh, these patients were uh, evaluated by not only cardiologist, interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, but also by heart failure specialists. And all GDMT up titration was done upfront and that's one of the reasons why this trial was a difficult trial to perform because after optimization of GDMT to maximally tolerated doses, a lot of these patients did not have uh, severe MR anymore. And the ones that continue to have severe, severe MR uh, clearly benefited uh, from this device. What about the primary safety uh, endpoint? This device has been shown to be very safe. Device-related complications are rare. Single leaflet device attachment, less than 1%, 0.7%. Device embolization, 0.3%. Endocarditis, zero. Mitral stenosis requiring surgery, zero. LVAD uh, or heart transplant, you know, 1.2% uh, and 0.8% respectively. So very low risk of complications. So this is a safe and effective treatment. How about the secondary endpoints? You know, no matter what endpoint you look, MR grade less than two plus at 12 months, all cause mortality, death and heart failure hospitalization, change in uh, KCCQ, quality of life, six minute walk distance, NYHA class, you know, all these endpoints were statistically significantly uh, 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 beneficial in the mitra clip plus GDMT arm. All cause mortality, again, statistically significant. You see the curve start diverging, diverging about six to nine months and continue to diverge out to 24 months. Number needed to treat was six. So again, very remarkable findings. Uh, death or heart failure hospitalization, again, statistically significant in favor of MitraClip. Number needed to treat 4.5. Uh, subgroup analysis, no matter how you look at the data based on age, gender, etiology, ischemic, non-ischemic, previous CRT or not, no CRT, STS scores, um, surgical risk, baseline EF, all of these are in favor of MitraClip plus guideline-directed medical therapy compared to medical therapy alone. Um, Again, 24-month event rates, cardiovascular uh, mortality, cardiovascular hospitalization were again statistically uh, significant in favor of MitraClip. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these slides, but this basically shows the change in KCCQ, which was again favorable for MitraClip. Six-minute walk distance was favorable for MitraClip compared to medical therapy alone. The MR severity, the results were, this is important, people ask me, is this durable? You know, do these patients you know, get progressive MR? The answer is no. Based on the COAP, you look at 30 days, 6 months, 12 months, 24 months, patients with less than 2 plus MR you know, are in their 90s. So these, these results are durable. Um, 
Elvero heart transplant, very few patients, uh, the statistically significant difference in the number of patients who ended up with an Elvero transplant, uh, only 4.4% in the clip arm compared to almost 10% in the medical therapy arm. Um, this is a slide which I found very interesting from the coapt. This shows the change in the left ventricular end diastolic volume from baseline. So on the left is baseline and this is 12 months. The blue is medical therapy, the green is mitral clip. When you look at medically treated patients, the left ventricular dimension based on the LV uh, diastolic volume continues to increase in the medically treated arm. Whereas in the mitral clip arm, that volume uh, it, it remains the same, if not reduces. So this is very important. The, the changes in the left ventricular uh, dimensions uh, over time are important. And we have a study uh, uh, that Deepan uh, leads the study. We're looking at MRI and understand better how uh, the LV remodeling occurs after mitra clip. So uh, all of you also know that the mitra FR, which is the European version of the COAPT, was, uh, was a negative study. Uh, what are the possible reasons? So there are several reasons why this study was negative. Uh, the entry criteria, the patient selection was much different in COAPT versus Mitra FR. The patients that were chosen for the Mitra FR were deemed to have severe FMR based on an EROA of more than 20, whereas in the COAPT they were more than 30. Uh, the EROA, the mean EROA was 30 in the Mitra FR as opposed to 40 in COAPT. The left ventricular uh, volumes were much larger in the Mitra FR patients compared to the COAPT patients. Um, so that's the, uh, the selection criteria. The guideline-directed medical therapy was also very different in mitral FR compared to the COAPT study. In the COAPT, remember I stated that these patients were very meticulously uptitrated before randomization uh, to maximally tolerated uh, doses of uh, uh, their uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or uh, beta blockers, whereas in the mitral FR, the, the medical titration was not as rigorous. In addition, the acute procedural results were, uh, were different. Uh, they were more uh, successful in reducing the MR in the COAPT study. The procedure complications were lower, and the rates of uh, significant mitral regurgitation at 12 months were significantly lower in the COAPT compared to the MITRA FR. So these may be some of the reasons why the MITRA FR uh, results were discordant from COAPT. Um, so just uh, to share a quick example of uh, FMR case. Again, these videos are supposed to play. Uh, this was a case actually uh, we did last week here at Houston Methodist, a patient with severe functional mitral regurgitation. You can appreciate with severe MR here. Uh, uh, this was an ischemic cardiomyopathy. The patient underwent one clip and uh, had a very successful result. Perhaps the next image will be more appealing. Uh, the pre mitral clip V wave was 64 millimeters of mercury and post uh, clip the V wave was down to 20 millimeters of mercury. So this was an excellent result and uh, this patient was feeling uh, symptomatically improved as early as next morning when I uh, rounded on him, he was able to be discharged. So based on the COAP data, the FDA approved mitroclip in functional mitral regurgitation patients who continue to have severe symptomatic MR despite uh, guideline directed medical therapy. This was approved back in um, March of last year. Moving on, uh, to explain the discordance uh, between the COAPT and the MITRA FR, this concept of proportionate and disproportionate MR is now um, evolving. Uh, uh, this was pioneered by Dr. Grayburn and Milton Packer. Um, so when you look at patients with functional MR, uh, the LV uh, enlarges, there is uh, apical displacement of the papillary muscles, there is annular dilatation. So they, they proposed this idea of severe and proportionate MR versus severe and disproportionate MR. And what are we talking about when we talk about proportionate or disproportionate? So we're looking at the LV end diastolic volume on the x-axis and the EROA or the effective regurgitative orifice area on the y-axis. So for a given end diastolic volume, when you look at the amount of MR, the COAP patients are felt to have disproportionately more MR or disproportionate MR for, their, for that particular end end diastolic volume, as opposed to mitra, uh, to mitra FR, where there is, uh, th these ventricles are, ventricles are larger and the degree of MR is less. Remember I said the EROA was 0.3, the mean EROA is 0.3 in the mitra FR, as opposed to 0.4 in the uh, COAPT. So this may be one of the reasons why the uh, results were discordant, because in the mitra FR, these ventricles were larger, they had proportionately severe MR for the degree of left ventricular dilatation, as opposed to disproportionately severe MR for the degree of the LV size in the COAPT. 
And just a quick slide, uh, this is hard off the press, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in JAMA Cardiology, uh, they looked at the EROA versus LVEDV volume and the magnitude of effect. Uh, when you look at the coapt subgroups, there is a subgroup which is a mitra fr like subgroup based, of, based on the uh, proportionate MR, based on their uh, ratio of EROA to LVEDV, which they found a cutoff of 0.14. If your ratio is less than 0.14, uh, they're classified as uh, proportionately, proportionate MR, and these are the group of patients that did not benefit. Whereas all the other subgroups of COAPT, which fall to the right of this line, meaning their ratio is more than 0.14, they were felt to have disproportionately severe MR, and they were found to have significant clinical benefit in the COAPT. So this field is evolving as we try to understand better why these patients are so different. I'm gonna skip through this. Moving on to the next part, which is the transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Uh, Cardiac CT plays a very important role in uh, evaluating these patients. There are several measurements as listed on this slide which are important, including the dimensions, the calcium, the leaflet length, interpapillary distance, the LVOT, which is one of the most important measurements, the new LVOT, which is the, uh, the modeled for the, for the size of the valve, and then you can calculate a new LVOT, can predict the risk of LVOT obstruction. This LVOT obstruction has been found to be a, uh, a pr significant predictor of mortality. And based on the CT modeling, we can, uh, we can figure out whether patient is at risk for new LVOT obstruction. And there are measures such as alcohol septal ablation or lampoon procedure to mitigate the risk of uh, LVOT obstruction. Um, the coronary sinus and the circumflex artery relationship is important uh, and has implications for annuloplasty devices such as the Carillon device. Here is the Carillon device which has two nitinol anchors uh, with a connecting nitinol wire. This device is inserted through the coronary sinus which lies behind the mitral annulus and the device is cinched leading to a indirect annuloplasty and increased cooptation of the mitral leaflets leading to reduction in the mitral regurgitation. So CT plays an important role in understanding the relationship of the coronary sinus to the annulus and also the circumflex coronary artery. Uh, Neocord, uh, this is another interesting device uh, by which uh, artificial cords are being able to be implanted in the mitral valve uh, with the help of a uh, thoracotomy inc incision. And now, uh, most recently, there is a transeptal version of this which is uh, going to be introduced uh, in the next 12 months uh, where neocords are inserted through the valve. Uh, this is primarily for degenerative MR where uh, artificial cords can be inserted from the valve and cinched to the apex, thereby reducing the degree of mitral regurgitation. Pascal system, which is, uh, to keep it simple, is the uh, Edwards version of the mitra clip. Uh, this consists of a central spacer uh, and paddles, uh, in addition to the, uh, 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 the clip where the, the leaflets are grasped between the paddle and the clasps, I should say. They call it paddle and clasps unlike mitral clip, and the leaflets are inserted, and there's a central spacer in the middle which reduces the degree of mitral regurgitation. So we are part of the class 2D uh, and class 2F uh, study, which is evaluating mitral clip uh, against the Pascal system in patients with severe MR. Um, the cardio band uh, is a direct annuloplasty system, which is uh, designed to reduce uh, mitral regurgitation through annular reduction. Uh, this is a transfemoral transeptal procedure uh, where the device is implanted on the mitral annulus posteriorly from the anterolateral commissure all the way down to the post, uh, posteromedial commissure. And then the device is cinched to uh, reduce the uh, annular dimensions and lead to better cooptation of the leaflets. Um, so this is another device which is being studied. This is a fluoroscopic image showing these uh, anchors, uh, if you will, uh, implanted on the mitral annulus. And subsequently when the device is cinched, these anchors are brought close together leading to reduction in the mitral annular dimensions and better cooptation and reduction in mitral regurgitation. Here's just an example. Uh, it may not play, I apologize. Um, imaging is key uh, for transcatheter, uh, any kind of transcatheter work, uh, particularly for the mitral and tricuspid valve. Here is an example uh, showing a patient with severe mitral and um, aortic valve disease, significant mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis. Uh, this was a case, uh, this was a CT measurements demonstrating almost 360 degrees uh, mitral annular calcification. This patient had concomitant transcatheter aortic valve replacement in addition to transcatheter mitral valve replacement with the Edward Sapien valve uh, with excellent result. Um, here is the left ventriculogram uh, demonstrating um, uh, trace mitral regurgitation. <clears throat> Uh, again, transesophageal echocardiogram uh, demonstrating good result here. No LVOT obstruction and uh, trace paravalvular leak. Uh, Alta valve, this is a new and exciting device. Uh, this is a, 
Uh, supraannular, this is a novel device, uh, as opposed to all of the other transcatheter mitral systems, uh, where there is a supraannular uh, valve, uh, which is a nitinol frame that sits in the left atrium. And we reported the first case of uh, Alta valve in the United States in a patient uh, who was a prohibitive surgical risk candidate with severe mitral regurgitation. The device was implanted via transapical approach. And you can see the frame is sitting in the left atrium. The native valve is still leaking, but the, the prosthetic valve uh, prevents any uh, mitral regurgitation. So this is a novel device, and we are also participating in the feasibility, US feasibility study uh, for the Alta valve. I'm going to skip through this. Paravalvular leak closure is also in our armamentarium. Apollo valve is a dedicated transcatheter mitral valve from, the, uh, from Medtronic that is uh, being studied. And the transfemoral uh, transeptal device is very exciting, and we are all uh, eagerly uh, awaiting um, uh, enrolling patients in this. Uh, I have uh, maybe 10 minutes, uh, Deepan. So we can talk a little bit about tricuspid uh, valve regurgitation. This is a patient I actually coincidentally saw earlier this week uh, in our hospital here. Uh, Nice lady with rheumatic heart disease, previous mitral, uh, mechanical mitral valve replacement who presented with recurrent episodes of edema, ascites, fatigue, reduced exercise tolerance. And you know, as soon as you walk in the room, you can see these neck veins. And this patient, uh, needless to say, has severe tricuspid regurgitation. And tricuspid regurgitation has been the forgotten valve uh, uh, but it's very important, and you know, this is uh, being recognized more and more as more and more devices uh, are on the horizon. So just a quick uh, slide on an anatomy of the tricuspid valve. There is a septal leaflet, the anterior leaflet, and the posterior leaflet. Um, and then the annulus is a saddle-shaped annulus. As tricuspid regurgitation occurs, uh, the annulus becomes flatter. There is more dilatation of the, along the anterolateral uh, aspect of the annulus. Uh, leading to non-coaptation of these leaflets. In vast majority, this starts in the anteroseptal and then extends out into the uh, posteroseptal commissures. So uh, similar to the mitral clip, similar to the mitral regurgitation prevalence slide, a large proportion of tricuspid regurgitation, regurgitation patients are untreated. Um, there is a huge unmet need. Vast majority of tricuspid regurgitation is secondary, meaning secondary to left-sided valve disease, either aortic valve disease, mitral valve disease, or LV dysfunction, or AFib. Uh, there are fewer patients with primary tricuspid valve disease. So vast majority that you're going to see in your practice are going to be patients who have left-sided disease. Uh, the prognosis with severe tricuspid regurgitation is obviously not good. 10-year survival is only 14%, and this uh, slide shows the significant morbidity associated with this, including heart failure hospitalizations with significant tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, important to know there are new stages of tricuspid uh, regurgitation beyond the conventional mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, there's now massive and torrential uh, uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, this publication by Becky Han and Dr. Zogby, uh, uh, based on the criteria, we can now classify this uh, into massive and torrential. And there's a reason for this. Uh, the tricuspid regurgitation has impact on outcomes. This slide shows worse outcomes. The more severe, MR, more severe TR you have, the worse outcomes. And then when you classify patients into severe versus more than severe, mass, massive and torrential, there is again a significant difference, meaning the massive and torrential patients are sicker. Surgery uh, includes tricuspid annuloplasty, care repair. Again, surgery is associated with significant early and late mortality. Uh, isolated tricuspid valve surgery is not very common. Um, there's a huge unmet need. Only if, uh, there are less than 8,000 tricuspid valve surgeries as opposed to 1.6 million cases of tricuspid regurgitation in the United States. So less than about 0.5% are being treated. The medical options are limited. There are a lot of tricuspid, and, uh, tricuspid transcatheter devices that are on the horizon as listed on this slide, basically based on annular modification techniques such as the tricinch, cardioband, millipede, leaflet apposition, which includes the Forma device and the mitra clip, and then of course the cable valve implantation. Um, here's a, a triclip case that we did. This is a patient with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Um, you know, the TE views are demonstrating the, uh, the clip being al aligned to the anterior and septal leaflets. And then uh, the clip is deployed in the anterior and septal leaflet and significant improvement compared to the uh, initial baseline tricuspid regurgitation. So triluminate is the study which is evaluating the feasibility and safety of tricuspid clipping. The early results from the uh, single arm study are promising, and we are now participating in the, in the uh, randomized pivotal trial, which is evaluating the dedicated triclip system, which is different from the mitra clip system, uh, which is what was used in the case that I showed you, uh, which was off-label use of the mitra clip. Uh, but in this study, this is a prospective randomized multi-center trial, which is going to enroll 450 patients in 80 sites in the United States, Canada, and Europe 
uh, evaluating the safety and efficacy of tricuspid clip and improving clinical outcomes in symptomatic patients with severe TR. So this is a, this is a, a trial uh, looking at the outcome of therapy. This is not just looking at the ability to grasp or clip the valve, but to look at the outcome. So this is a very well-designed study uh, looking at TR reduction, change in uh, uh, quality of life, heart failure hospitalizations, and of course mortality. And we are uh, embarking on this journey, and this is going to be a very important trial, just like the COAP trial, I think, in the future uh, in, this, in the tricuspid space. Here are the inclusion criteria and some of the exclusion criteria for the, uh, for the uh, triluminate study. Uh, patients uh, with EF of less than 20% or very severe pulmonary hypertension, more than 70 millimeters of mercury will be excluded. Uh, pacemaker uh, is not a exclusion for this trial, as long as the pacemaker lead is not going to be in, in the way of grasping the leaflets. So this is uh, something we are very excited about. The Edwards cardio band, similar to the mitral regurgitation, uh, has been uh, used in the tricuspid space. There's a patient of mine who underwent, uh, this is a, a pre-procedural uh, transesophageal echo. She had a lead, the lead was extracted, but the tricuspid regurgitation did not improve. And you can see on the bottom panel here, the cardio band implanted uh, on the tricuspid annulus and then cinched, and then the post uh, annuloplasty uh, tricuspid regurgitation is, uh, is trace. So this is another exciting device that is being studied. The former tricuspid valve therapy system by Edwards uh, consists of a spacer which is positioned within the uh, tricuspid orifice and provides a surface for the native leaflets to coapt against. It is advanced from the subclavian um, vein and uh, it is anchored at the uh, RV apex and again at the subclavian vein. And this is being studied um, and uh, the early preliminary results show significant improvement uh, in the degree of tricuspid regurgitation. Fortec tricinch system is another device that we have, uh, we, you know, we are participating in this study here. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, robust coil which is implanted transmurally in the free wall of the right uh, ventricle just above the tricuspid annulus. Uh, and there is a tension band followed by a nitinol stent which is delivered in the vena cava. And this leads to uh, annular reduction and improved coaptation of the tricuspid leaflet thereby reducing TR. So there are several devices uh, as we talked about here and we are very excited about this space and uh, there is lots more to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you, thank you very much Sachin. That was a, a phenomenal uh, presentation and I think it really highlights uh, the creativity of the engineers and the interventional cardiologists to come up with a variety of different approaches uh, to treat uh, the, especially the secondary valvular disease. So uh, we've got a few minutes for uh, any questions. So again, uh, please uh, feel free to text in your questions uh, at uh, 37607, just type debakey, uh, or uh, go to pollev.com slash debakey. Uh, while we're waiting, let me start off with a couple questions for you, Sachin. So sure. first off, um, I think you did a very nice job uh, presenting the secondary MR uh, co-op study. And I know that uh, the study was uh, published in 2018, got FDA approval in 2019. I is it now at the point where it's got CMS approval as well, so it can be uh, done routinely we're in almost there. patients? That's a great question. So we're almost there. There's always a lag phase between the FDA yeah. approval and the CMS approval. We were told in February that you know, the CMS approval is right around the corner. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, with the current situation and the healthcare yeah. crisis, everything is, is falling behind. But we hope that in the, in the next couple of months, we should have CMS approval where we can offer this therapy and, you know, get reimbursed at the same time uh, for purely functional MR patients. Great. That's, that's, that's useful to know. And let me ask you then, once, uh, I guess, the floodgates are open at that point, uh, clearly since we, we, we've seen that there's some uh, discrepancy or differences in results, uh, between the two uh, big studies uh, for secondary MR, the, the COAPT and the Mitro FR studies, uh, it sounds like patient selection is going to be key. And maybe if you could walk us through what's going to be your approach to patient selection uh, for secondary MR edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair. That's a great question, Deepan. I think this is something that we, you know, we deal with every day and uh, this is what everybody's asking. And I really like the concept of the proportionate and the disproportionate MR that Paul Grayburn is proposing. And uh, you know, when you look at the subgroup analysis from COAPT, there's clearly a Mitra FR-like cohort uh, in COAPT that did not derive the clinical benefit because they, they had larger LVs, their LVs were too far gone, and the degree of their mitral regurgitation was proportionate or not as bad as the other cohorts. So the disproportionate MRs, their, their LVs were not as large 
and they were the ones that derived significant benefit from uh, the mitra clip. So in my practice, you know, I, I look at the LV size, the LV ejection fraction. You know, of course, the medical therapy is very important. So if you work, you know, very closely with our heart failure colleagues, make sure that they're on high doses of uh, maximally tolerated, uh, you know, medical regimen, not just you know, 2.5 of lisinopril and 3.125 of Coreg. Uh, you know, although some patients are limited by symptoms, you know, when you try to advance these uh, doses, they, they get hypotensive and symptomatic. So again, you know, we closely work with our heart failure colleagues and, you know, rely upon them to adequately uptitrate their medications. And then if they're still symptomatic and if they still have significant mitral regurgitation, then those are the patients I would consider for the, for the mitral clip. Uh, you know, I think MRI may play an important role in these patients to ascertain the LV size, the LV volumes. Uh, you know, so th this is something that we need to learn. Uh, and uh, I think we are learning this. Um, you know, the imaging is, is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, these are the important things that we are gleaning from these two studies. And to, you know, to obtain coap like results, it, you know, it is important to, you know, offer it to coap like patients. Yeah. You know, if you have patients outside of those criteria, you can, you know, do it, but, you know, you have to lower the expectations. And, you know, if the patients are really sick and they have no other options, you know, it may be reasonable to consider. There may still be a gray zone that, you know, we, we don't know. There may, pa there may be patients that may still benefit but I think this remains to be studied and you know, we, need, we still need to learn more about these patients. Great. Patients, now I, I'll also point out that patients with se severe tricuspid regurgitation were excluded from COAPT, but uh, now that we have triluminate, you know, I, I think we have to think and uh, you know, reevaluate these patients. Uh, I don't think we need to exclude all patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Um, you know, we can wait 60 days after the mitra clip before they can be considered for the triluminate study. So I think it's important to know mm -hmm. that patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation, you know, again, provided that, you know, they don't have, you know, horrible RVs, you know, uh, blown out LVs, you know, there may be a subgroup of patients that may be suitable after mitraclip for the triluminate study and may be uh, potentially enrollable in the mm -hmm. triluminate and, and could, could derive benefit. Great, good, and and uh, that, that was gonna be my next question is is transition to the tricuspid valve, which I think is even more of an emerging frontier. So the first question is, you know, the, the new therapies now, that, for example, this, the, the uh, device that you're looking at in the triluminate study, is it simply just a different delivery system or is the device itself, is the clip itself uh, somewhat different? Because we know that the anatomy of the tricuspid valve is, is quite a bit different than the anatomy of the mitral valve. Great question, Deepan. So one of the slides that fell off was, uh, you know, so now we have uh, newer versions of the mitra clip, the mitra clip NTR, mitra clip XTR. The, the devices used in the original Everest and the Coab were the NT devices, but the NTR device is a newer version that came out two and a half years ago, which has improved uh, torque delivery, and the XTR has wider clip arms. So we have uh, two more commercially available uh, devices, uh, which are better than the original mitra clip. Uh, and then there is a generation four mitra clip, which is gonna be a wider mitra clip. So there are several uh, newer versions of mitra clip that are becoming available, and we need to learn which patients are best suited for what type of clip. To specifically answer the question about tricuspid, the tricuspid, not only are we going to use the NTR and the XTR, but also we have a dedicated tricuspid delivery system, which is much different from the off-label mitra clip uh, delivery system that we were using. Uh, in TR cases. So this is the newer delivery system which is more intuitive and has uh, you know different uh, steering capability which is geared specifically to the tricuspid valve which makes grasping um, uh, much easier. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of things that will be studied uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, so it's not not only the delivery system but also you know the type of clips and we are, we are learning more um, as we go along. Um, you know, there's, a, there's re registry data which are coming out looking at which patients are best suited for NTR versus XTR. And I, I, I trust the same will happen in the tricuspid space as well. Great. Well, great. Uh, th Sachin, once again, uh, phenomenal uh, Grand Rounds presentations. Uh, very glad to have you here. And thank you for doing this. Thank you very much, Deepa. Okay, bye-bye. All right, very nice.